All right, good morning and welcome to the City Club Missoula's July Forum. It's too hot, it's too smoky, how we're addressing Missoula's changing climate. My name is Brett Rosenberg and I have the privilege of serving as chair of the City Club Missoula's Board of Directors. I am so glad to see so many of you here today virtually with us. City's, City Club's mission is to bring people together to inform and inspire on issues vital to the community through public forums that encourage the discussion of new ideas and free exchange of thought. We have a deep commitment to the civility and, and civil discourse, even when we often discuss very controversial issues. Before I introduce our moderator and our panel today, some thank yous are in order. Thanks much to the University of Montana and Sarah Scalise for making this virtual forum happen. Thanks also to Missoula Community Access Television, which records our forums as part of their media assistance grants to nonprofit organizations. MCAT serves our community on cable channels 189 and 190. You can also find videos of past CCM forums by clicking the video button on our website, cityclubmissoula.com. And thanks to our sponsors, particularly those at the executive level. In addition to the university, they are Blackfoot Communications and First Security Bank. We also like to highlight some other sponsors every month. So today we wanna to recognize Cost Care and the WGM Group. We're grateful to our very diverse group of sponsors and we invite you to join them by going to our website and of course, thanks to our board of directors and our administrator, Eric Legbold. City Club Missoula would also like to acknowledge that we are in the Aboriginal territories of the Salish and Kalispell people, some of whom are present with us today at our forum. Today, we honor the path they have always shown us in caring for this place and the generations to come. Today's panel will be moderated by Brian Van Losberg. Brian is a second term Missoula City Council Alderman representing Ward 1, which includes the North Side, Rattlesnake, and downtown areas. He serves as council president and has championed local policy around renewable energy and climate change, Missoula's water utility and gun violence prevention, among others. Formerly the executive director of Montana's Alternative Energy Resources Organization and the Tahoe Bacall Institute of California's Lake Tahoe area, he has an MS in environmental studies from the University of Montana and a BS in mechanical engineering from Stanford. In a past life, Brian was an engineering manager at semiconductor equipment maker Applied Materials and NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, where he worked on the Hubble Space Telescope repair mission and the 1997 Mars Pathfinder program. Brian, his wife Genevieve, and nine-year-old daughter Austin Rose live in the north side. Brian will introduce our panel and I will see you at the break around 12.15 once the panelists have finished their presentation. Then you'll have the opportunity to ask questions to our panelists. All right, over to you, Brian, thanks so much. Thank you so much, Brett, and my thanks as well, again, to City Club for hosting uh, these really important community conversations. Uh, it's my honor to introduce the panelists today uh, and just wanted to quickly mention um, to call this a timely conversation would be the understatement of the decade or the century, uh, one only has to look at the forecast, the record heat waves that we've experienced, uh, the ones to come, the drought, uh, the Hudal fishing restrictions that showed up on many of uh, Western Montana, Montana's rivers in late June. Uh, and it makes me think a lot about a slide I saw from Dr. Steve Running at UM uh, about the trend over the last hundred plus years in our area with days above a certain temperature, I believe it was 90 degrees and days below uh, a certain temperature, uh, some, some negative number. And the trend is indisputable, uh, hotter days and less uh, really cold days. Uh, and I'd be remiss in not mentioning this is the time of daily emails from Sarah Cofield that uh, I don't think I could get through the day without. Um, so again, this is a, a timely conversation. And with that, I wanna introduce uh, three panelists today. Um, Amy Sillenberg is the Executive Director of Climate Smart Missoula, where she leads a team that engages our community in climate actions, catalyzing efforts to reduce our carbon footprint and build a resilient Missoula. Amy helped launch Climate Smart in 2015, following efforts to develop Missoula's municipal and community climate action plans, and has worked on climate and energy policy at the local, state, and federal levels for over a decade. Amy holds a Master's of Science in Wildlife Biology from the University of Montana and previously worked as the Director of Climate Policy and Bird Conservation with Montana Audubon and as an Ornithologist with the University of Montana. 
Next, I'd like to introduce Caroline Lauer. Caroline is Missoula County's Climate Resilience Coordinator, where she oversees the implementation of climate adaptation strategies across the county. Prior to joining the county, Caroline was the program director for Climate Smart Missoula, where she worked on a variety of local climate mitigation and resiliency efforts. She holds a master's in urban planning from Harvard University's Graduate School of Design and is grateful to spend her days working toward a more resilient and equitable community. And then finally, I'd like to introduce Diana Mineta in her role as sustainability program manager for Missoula County. Diana is responsible for the county's efforts to address climate change. Diana has worked in the field of energy and climate for 15 years, including previous positions as executive director of the Montana Renewable Energy Association and as an advisor at the California Energy Commission. She has a master's degree in energy and resources from UC Berkeley. And lastly, I'd just like to say what an honor it is for me to share the stage, so to speak, virtually with Amy and Caroline and Diana. I've worked with all of them for years, even prior to being elected to council eight years ago. And we could not have a smarter, more dedicated and more empathetic group of professionals working these issues in the community. As a policymaker, as a concerned and engaged member of the community, as a husband and as a father, I'm exceedingly grateful that they make Missoula their home and work on these issues. So thank you. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to the first of the presenters. Uh, take it away. Thank you so much, Brian. Let me share our screen. We're all here together. All right, well, Brian took a few of my first opening points, but welcome everyone. We're so happy to be here to talk with you all today virtually. And our presentation, It's Too Hot, too, It's Too Smoky, really does feel like it couldn't have been better timed as smoke arrived in our valley this weekend and it's in the forecast for the next few days. And I know we've all kind of been struggling through the, the extreme heat that we've seen so early this summer. Again, I'm Caroline Lauer, the Climate Resilience Coordinator for Missoula County, and today we'll be discussing what a climate resilient Missoula looks like and what we can all do. I'll frame our discussion. Amy will offer a concrete example of current climate adaptation efforts, and Diana will discuss what Missoula is doing to eliminate carbon pollution and how we still all have a choice to make about the future we're going to see. So many of us who have been to any sort of climate presentation have seen one of these trend graphs. Brian mentioned it in his introductory remarks. Um, but today we don't really have much interest in these abstract graphs because the truth is we are experiencing the effects of climate the climate crisis right now. Um, the effects are upon us and uh, they're occurring in this very moment. So to that end, we have a poll to engage all of you. Um, if uh, Sarah, you could cue this up, we'd like to ask what statement best matches how you felt during our recent heat wave? A, B, C, or D? Uh, whether you loved it, you made your way through it, or you hated it, or just uh, hoping there's not smoke. <laughs> so we'll give everyone a few seconds to put their answers in. All right, Sarah, could you close the poll and show us the results? All right, so no one is here because they wanted to move to Phoenix. Uh, a couple of people muddled their way through it, were miserable, and then the majority of people are saying, I'm okay with the heat, but please don't tell me it's going to be smoky. All right, thank you, um, everyone. Yeah, I think we were, we were, the three of us were collectively somewhere in the, the miserable to not great. And also, I, <laughs> please don't tell me it's smoky. So, uh, well, you know, some people think, you know, I can handle the heat. Um, and uh, it's not that big of a deal. It's maybe not that sinister. Just get in the river. What's, what's the big deal? I know I was floating in the river yesterday and saw at least 25% of Missoula there. So it is a great resource. But I also want to say that the heat has serious and critical health impacts. Just sampling a few of the headlines from the end of June, early July, um, you know, hundreds hospitalized, dozens dead. It's impacting our farm workers, food workers, the crops we grow, hospitalizations are up. And um, we are seeing these fishing restrictions already with low stream flows and high temperatures. And so, 
whether you are a person living and breathing uh, here or wildlife, um, or you own a business that depends on those things, climate change can and will affect our health, food systems, businesses, ecosystems, just about everything. And it's doing so today, right now. And so hearing these things can sometimes make us wanna put our heads in the sand um, and resort to a, a business as usual approach. And the more I thought about this phenomenon preparing for this presentation, the more I realized it reminded me of one of those pharmaceutical prescription drug ads that paints this really happy picture of what um, life could be like with apparently no downsides until you get to the speed read of all the side effects at the end. And so just look at these folks here, they look really happy, they're thrilled, they've got some graphs in the background, maybe there's some quarterly projections for profit. Um, you know, you, it looks good, but there are these little side effects at the bottom of the screen that are obscured. And when we enlarge them, uh, we see side effects may include, but are not limited to poverty, smoke-filled valleys, asthma attacks, devastating wildfires, higher mortality rates, depression, drought, loss of appetite, loss of food availability, anxiety, flooding, economic devastation, uninhabitable planet, and just picture that in a sing-songy voice while inspirational music is playing. And you realize we cannot continue with business as usual. When you think about what that approach will bring us, it's just unacceptable. And so we need a new approach. And at the, the same time, the painful truth of all of this is that the climate crisis increases inequality exponentially because it impacts frontline communities and those who are already at the margins first and worst. And it's a pretty simple formula when you think about it, inequality raised to the power of the climate crisis. And you see here that we can't address one without the other. Trying to reduce the base without thinking about the exponent is futile and the other way around. And so we have to be viewing these things in tandem. We have to be addressing the climate crisis while also building a more equitable society. And at the same time, when we make investments in our, our social infrastructure and our heart infrastructure, we need to be doing so within the lens of climate change. And so while, while we prepared this presentation, I realized that I had a lot of the, the harder to hear information. And so I imagine some of you might be having a stress response right now which uh, we can assure you is perfectly natural. We go through our stress responses regularly throughout the day. And we're, a lot of us are familiar with fight versus flight, which in this context might be something like, ah, I will solve this by myself, um, really independently minded versus flight of, oh, climate change, what? Oh, I, I don't know, someone else will fix that. But as you can see, those aren't particularly helpful responses given the scale and the nature of the, the problem. And so I wanna introduce and familiarize everyone with two different stress responses, tend to the young and most vulnerable and befriend and turn to social groups for support. And so in this context, that might look like something like, who needs a HEPA filter? I've got extra, or I feel sad and scared when I'm alone. What can we all do together? And so these responses are not only more helpful in a, on a personal level, but they can also be a really helpful way to frame community climate efforts more broadly. And so in that vein, I wanna introduce Climate Ready Missoula, which is our countywide climate resiliency plan um, that the city and county adopted in May of 2020, and which is what my position was created to help um, implement. And it is at its core, a tend and befriend approach. When the, the project started, when the planning process started, uh, it started with the question of tending. So who and what is most vulnerable given the climate change impacts that we will experience in Missoula? From the way our summers are getting hotter and smokier and drier to wetter, more, more, wetter winters and springs with more flooding. And then um, new variability and climate migration as well. And now as we move into implementation, we're also taking that tend approach. We are trying to have every decision ask these questions through an equity lens. So is it affordable for low-income residents? Does it increase quality of life and access to resources for frontline communities? Does it rectify past discriminatory or problematic actions? Does it increase, increase access to information, increase social cohesion? And does it recognize and advance traditional ecological knowledge? And so we're trying to integrate this into every aspect of Climate Ready Missoula. So that's the 10 side of things, but it is also at its core a befriend approach as well. This is just a rough drawing of all of the connections 
between the sectors of the plan, I assure you there are hundreds more connections when you look at all of the strategies in it. And this plan was designed to build on and enhance all of the great work that's already going on and to embrace interconnection and not try to silo different sectors that are working on the problem. And I think the foreword to the Climate Ready Missoula Plan gets at the heart of this. Um, it reads, implementation of the plan will thus by necessity involve dozens of organizations, individuals, city and county departments and other government agencies that are active in these areas. It will take all of us and given the urgency, the sooner we get started, the better. And so in that, in that light, I would like to um, pass it over to my friend and colleague, Amy Sillenberg, who will talk about Climate Ready Missoula implementation in action. So Amy, I will scoot out of the way. Great, thank you so much, Caroline. That was really wonderful. Uh, yeah, so let me um, see if I can dive right in here. Climate Ready Missoula in action. So Caroline set the stage for me to showcase Climate Ready Missoula in action. And we know that increasing heat, wildfires and wildfire smoke um, are our most significant risks given climate change. And today we are launching Missoula Wildfire Smoke Ready Week because it is time to be prepared. And it's gonna start, well, the M Missoula County Commissioners have already proclaimed, and tonight at city council meeting, the mayor will sign a proclamation that will resolve, we have wildfire smoke ready week. Um, it's an opportunity to educate and help our community and county to be healthier and take care of each other and really get a in front of what could be a long and challenging wildfire smoke season. So it's the first ever for Missoula and as far as we know, the first ever for Montana. So I'll offer some specifics of this week and ways that you can get involved in just a few minutes. But I wanted to uh, showcase or share a little bit about how we got here. The roots of this particular week and actually Wildfire Smoke Ready Week and Climate Ready Missoula itself are really, um, the origins are within the origins of Climate Smart Missoula and our key program that really helped us launch, which is Summer Smart. How do we best weather the weather? Um, that back in about 2015, both our organization and Summer Smart got going. And from the very beginning, there was a focus on focus on equity, what Caroline described as tend and befriend. How do we think about who and what is most vulnerable and how do we address those? This is a work in progress. This is our life's works. We don't have all the answers, but that really is at the root and the core of where we are today and what I'm going to describe in Wildfire Smoke Ready Week. So again, we don't have time to uh, go into the whole backstory of what we learned from the time we started in 2015 um, until today, but we have learned a lot. When we first started, it seemed like our community strategy to deal with wildfire smoke was to pray for rain or leave town. Now, if you're a homebound senior uh, or you're a farm worker, you don't exactly have the opportunity to just get up and leave. And we know that that is not an equitable strategy for most of our community. And so <laughs> we decided we had to do more. Um, I started working um, actually back in around 2016 before the catastrophic fires of 2017 with Sarah Cofield, Missoula County's air quality specialist, or she's the air quality specialist for Missoula City County Health Department, um, to be accurate. Many of you know Sarah and you know when you get her blogs and her descriptions of, of what's happening out there when the smoke rolls into town. Um, so we started working together and since 2015, we have learned a lot. Um, and again, in particular, we learned a lot during that really challenging 2017 smoke year. We've had a couple of years where it's been pretty nice. Um, but that year was basically triage. She and I trying to figure out how we could get money to buy more HEPA air filters to get them to who and most who was most in need, young infants, people living in Sealy Lake. Schools were opening, the air quality was horrible. It was, it was pretty chaotic. I don't think she and I slept a whole lot, but we got through it and we learned some things. <laughs> and, and one is that we actually, there are things that we can actually do. Um, and it's really better to prepare than react. That summer was one of complete reaction. And since then we've built up a community and partners that can allow us to better prepare. 
And that's the other thing we learned is that we need partners. We need more people in this together. So that Climate Ready program has really, um, our whole effort has really helped instill that. We have a working group, we're United Ways involved. We've got you know, um, the Office of Emergency Management, a lot of nonprofit organizations and even individuals, even individuals that see the risk from wildfire smoke and step in and say, hey, you know, I'm a retired engineer and I might be able to help you figure out how we could have cleaner indoor air. Um, I'll speak a little bit more about my friend Tom Javins in just a minute, but it's everybody stepping up and we really have a coalition of partnership that is bringing this wildfire smoke week to you. So those lessons were, were hard learned and they're not, we're not done learning them and they may seem pretty obvious. Um, we've also learned a lot about wildfire smoke and to quote Sarah Co Cofield, the smoke, it's nasty business. It's really quite harmful. It gets into your lungs and actually into your bloodstream. And the it is the fine particulate matter, we call it PM2.5. And it um, burrows deep into your lungs, gets into your bloodstream and elicits an immune, res uh, immune response and affects your heart, your lungs, and your ability to, um, your, your basic immune system. And it affects different people differently. Um, there are people most at risk, young children, babies, the elderly, people that have respiratory um, diseases or have, are COPD, different um, conditions for which, yeah, asthma for one, for which smoke is particularly harmful, but really um, it affects everyone. Um, the more we have, the more that there is smoke, the worse it gets um, and the worse we all feel it. And worse still, it does get into our homes. That's something we've learned. All of this, the we is researchers from the University of Montana, the EPA, some of us doing this individual research ourselves, a lot of reading of peer review studies because people are doing this kind of research now around the West and around the country. Um, so we do know that there are harms. And again, I'm not gonna go into too much more detail than that. But we also have learned over the last few years that are things that we can do to mitigate those harms, especially regarding clean indoor air. We used to tell people to just go inside and then we had some air sensors and we realized that the air quality was actually unhealthy inside. But helping with our friend Tom helping us um, and folks at the University of Montana helping us too, we have two great recommendations. Um, HEPA portable air cleaners, I hope everybody listening um, has one of these or might go get one, or you can take a box fan and you can get a high efficiency filter from a local hardware store and you can duct tape them together. A couple more details than that, but basically you can build a do-it-yourself fan filter system. Um, these are things that we can do and these are also things that we can do for our neighbors and for folks that don't have the means or abilities to go bring these into their home to make sure that they have clean indoor air. And then there are lots of other things that can we can do for commercial spaces or people that you know have forced air or HVAC systems. Um, there's other things you can do, but that's just a taste of some of the things we've learned and are encouraging. And that's some of what we are doing with our week, Wildfire Smoke Ready Week. So this is just a, a picture of one of the social media posts that we have already launched this morning, um, helping people to get ready and going into detail about where the smoke come from, how you find out what the air quality is, um, how you can get yourself an air filter and um, how you can help other folks do that same thing. So, um, but in all of this work, what we do in all our, our media outreach that we've been doing and in this week, we're directing people to wild, montanawildfiresmoke.org, which is a landing place, a website that just has all this information packed into it. Um, and we encourage you to go there and share this and share this with your friends. There's videos, there's little, all kinds of great things on the site. And really it actually came out of the 2017 catastrophic smoke fire season. And um, it was an opportunity to share what we're learning with not just Missoula community, but with the county and beyond and all of Montana who experienced the smoke. So check that out and refer people back here. Um, some of the things that we're doing within this week of education and outreach, um, we were, Sarah and I had a piece, and Caroline, a piece in the Missoulian yesterday. Sarah is going to have more pieces in the Missoulian this week about what to do. Um, we are on the radio. We are, have public service announcements across different radio platforms. Again, trying to reach people that don't necessarily already plugged into this issue, reading Sarah's, you know, in-depth blogs. Um, we're hitting you with some radio ads. Um, social media, if you would like to join us, the hashtag is wildfire smoke ready. Um, and we'll be using that a lot and sharing it. We even have a place on our website where you can find all of the pre-made pieces that we're gonna share on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, again, to get the word out and help people understand um, there's risks, but there's things you can do. 
And we're pretty excited. We even have, hopefully this will work, our own jingle created by um, Missoula's own Travis Ross. It happens every year, and you should be aware of the particular particulates up in the air. The smoke comes in through the windows and doors. It makes your eyes, lungs, and throat so sore. But you can be so safe inside. Oh, if the air is filtered right. It happens every year, and you should be aware of the particular particulates up in the air. Visit MontanaWildfireSmoke.org for more information. So we hope you enjoyed that. So there are things that we're doing in Wildfire Smoke Week. And again, the WE is a big partnership group. Um, you can help, again, the tend and befriend um, theme that we spoke about today. Um, you could go to montanawildfiresmoke.org and actually you can go into the About Us page and there's a way that you can donate and support. Money will come in, Climate Smart Missoula collects that and we can go buy more fans, filters and HEPA portable air cleaners and get those out to people. Um, you could just, when you're going to get your own filter, buy two. This is my friend Pat, when he bought his filter, he bought a second one. He said, here, you guys give this to somebody in need. And that's all great, and we really encourage that. Beyond that, too, though, we're a small organization. Even the partnership within Wildfire Smoke Ready Week, um, there's only a handful of us. So if you in your communities, your local groups, some of your social groups, um, want to get together and get a bunch of filters, build some do-it-yourself systems, and get them out to the folks that you know may be in need. Um, I know it's not that easy necessarily to know who's in need, but I think our community has really strengthened. We are more cohesive. There was a lot of work done during COVID and the economic downturn to figure out how we can reach out to those around us and help. And air quality is one of those ways that we can, you know, really help our community members. So please take some onus upon yourself if that fits for you. Um, and then we've been doing a little bit of tabling. We were out last week um, trying to get, again, the information out. This is just a sample of our brochure that we have. We're happy to share those with folks. And on July 17th, this coming weekend, we're going to be at the farmer's market, um, you know, just giving out information, talking to people at both of the markets. And we feel like this is really important. If you'd like to come help us, you're welcome to, because one of the other things we want to do during this time is we have a special little information packet brochure for outdoor workers. Our farmers, people at the, have booths at the farmer's market, um, they keep us healthy with the wonderful, beautiful food that they grow, and they have to be outside. They don't have the, the flexibility of just going and hanging out inside when the smoke is bad. Hopefully, they can get some filters and have clean indoor air to get that respite at night, but we need to help them and share that information with them so they can keep growing the food that we love. So we're making a particular effort to um, to work with farmers and other outdoor workers this year as part of our Wildfire Smoke Ready Week. There's a lot, there's a lot to do. Again, we'd love your help. But is this just all so much? It's all too much. You might be feeling when you look out at the window that I just can't take this. <laughs> um, and sometimes again, as Caroline mentioned, we do feel that and we try to find ways to um, actually encourage a little bit of, of joy, a little bit of fun, um, to get through this together because the blue skies will come. They'll be here and they'll be back again um, for good in the fall. So along those lines, we have one other event. Um, this Wednesday at Imagination Brewing, we have a taste test happening at 5.30. We have a special beer that Imagination has brewed for us called Deep Breath. And it is the beer of climate resiliency. It's the beer of the future when we actually act on climate. And there's going to be a little taste test with some elected officials versus another drink they're preparing called Smoked Out. What if we can't grow hops anymore because it's too hot? And what if there are challenges to our water systems? Smoked Out drink might not be, it is, it could be the beer of the future. It's the beer of the future if we don't act. So we're going to talk a little bit about climate change. We're going to do a fun taste test uh, with some of our elected officials at 530. And then following that, uh, the experts, Sarah Cofield and Tom Javins, uh, are going to be there. We're going to have a little ask an expert uh, time. So if you have burning questions about um, wildfire smoke and how to address it, um, you're welcome to come and talk to them and just kind of get together about how we can best as a community um, weather this weather and the smoke. And again, this beer is going to be great. And you can even buy Sarah and Tom a beer because they've done some amazing work and continue to do so. So I hope we'll see you out in the community in one form or another. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Diana to help us understand how we don't end up in a smoked out world in the future. Hey, 
Thank you so much, Amy. And thank you to the whole team behind Wildfire Smoke Ready Week. It's so incredibly important to help our community prepare for these hot and smoky summers, especially given the climate projections that tell us that our summers are only getting hotter and they're only getting smokier. But I wanna say a word about those climate projections because I think it's very important to understand that the future is not foretold. Our climate is changing, that's clear, but how severe these changes get, including how much hotter and how much smokier it gets here in Missoula, that's up to us. If we continue with business as usual, emitting carbon globally like there's no tomorrow, then things are gonna get ugly. But if we treat this situation like the emergency that it is, and we do what the science tells us we must, and we phase out the, the use of fossil fuels entirely in the near future, then things won't be so bad. And what that means is that we have two very crucial tasks before us. The first is to manage the unavoidable. Our climate is changing. Some level of additional change is already baked in based on emissions um, in the past. As a community, we have to prepare for and adapt to these changes, and we have to make sure that no one gets left behind as we do that. That's the purpose of Climate Ready Missoula. That's what Caroline and Amy have been talking about. But we have one other crucial task, and that is to avoid the unmanageable. That means doing everything we can here locally to reduce our contribution to climate change, while also pushing for real and meaningful climate action at the state and federal levels so that things don't get so bad. What's cool is that some of the things we need to do to adapt to climate change also, in fact, reduce our contribution to it. This is especially true when it comes to our buildings. To adapt to hotter summers and more wildfire smoke, we need to make our homes and buildings less leaky and better insulated so that they stay cooler in hotter temperatures and the indoor air has a chance of staying cleaner during wildfire smoke periods. It turns out, of course, that weatherizing buildings also has the advantage of reducing the amount of energy needed to keep them cool in the summer and keep them warm in the winter. That reduces carbon emissions, and it also makes living in these buildings safer, more comfortable, and more affordable, which is especially important for low-income residents who often live in older, less weatherized homes and spend a larger fraction of their income on heating and cooling. So building weatherization sits right at the intersection of climate adaptation, climate mitigation, and equity. Clearly, this is a high priority. That's why the city and county are partnering on a project led by Climate Smart Missoula called Buildings for the Future, which is focused on identifying and implementing the most effective strategies to accelerate energy efficiency in our buildings. So what else can we do to avoid the unmanageable? Many things, but one that I wanna talk about, an effort that's underway, is our 100% clean electricity initiative. In 2019, the city and county jointly adopted a goal of 100% clean electricity for the Missoula urban area by 2030. Clean electricity is an incredibly important part of avoiding the unmanageable since our electricity sector is a major contributor to climate change through the burning of coal and fossil gas to produce electricity. And of course, the technologies needed to produce electricity cleanly are widely available and in widespread use. The price of solar panels dropped 90% in the last decade. The price of wind turbines dropped 70% in the same time period. Wind and solar are the least expensive and fastest growing electricity sources worldwide. But these encouraging trends shouldn't make us complacent. Fossil fuels still provide more than 80% of the energy we use globally, and we're not on anything close to the trajectory needed to phase that out entirely in order to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. That's why local governments around the country, including Missoula city and county, are taking it upon themselves to say, we're going to do whatever we can to shift to clean electricity locally, because this is essential to protect our communities and our residents, and it just isn't happening fast enough. Of course, even if we do achieve 100% clean electricity, that won't phase out fossil fuels. We also use fossil fuels in our cars and our trucks in the form of gasoline and diesel. We use them in our buildings in the form of gas heating, gas water heating, gas stoves. But most experts agree that the easiest and lowest cost way to phase out those fossil fuels is to electrify our transportation sector and our buildings 
In other words, replace internal combustion vehicles with electric vehicles, like Mountain Line is doing for our buses, and replace gas heaters in our buildings with electric heat pump systems, which is another technology that's, in, that's uh, improved rapidly in recent years, including for cold climates like ours. And also electrify commercial buildings and industrial processes to the extent possible. And if we do all that in tandem with the shift to 100% clean electricity, then we actually have a shot at phasing fossil fuels out nearly entirely and avoiding catastrophic climate change. And we'll create millions of new jobs in the process. So back to Missoula. You might be wondering, how is our 100% clean electricity effort going? Well, I'll tell you up front that it's hard. The city and county recognized when adopting the 100% clean electricity goal that it would be a big challenge, not least because of the way our electricity sector is regulated in the state of Montana. Um, Montanans receive their electricity from monopoly utilities regulated by the Public Service Commission. They don't, we don't have a choice of our electricity provider and we don't have a choice of, of the sources of electricity that they use to supply us. In the Missoula urban area, 95% of our electricity is supplied by Northwestern Energy, our monopoly utility. So shortly after the city and county adopted this goal, we met with Northwestern Energy. Um, they expressed interest in working with us to help achieve it. And so um, we thought it was important to put that agreement to work together in writing and develop a memorandum of understanding that was signed last summer um, by the three parties, the city, the county, and Northwestern Energy. Um, and in which all three committed to working together on projects and programs to advance that clean electricity goal. We're currently working on some projects related to that, including the development of a renewable rate option, which we hope will give Northwestern Energy customers the option to buy into newly developed large scale renewable energy projects through a special rate on their electric bills. That's a joint effort with the cities of Bozeman and Helena who have also adopted 100% clean electricity goals for their communities. But it's also become increasingly clear over the months that the collaboration with Northwestern Energy isn't going to get us all the way to 100% clean electricity. We just haven't been able to find alignment on enough projects and programs to get us all the way there. That work with Northwestern is valuable, but it's very clear that the city and county will need to pursue other partners and other opportunities to accomplish that goal. In the meantime, Northwestern Energy recently submitted an application to the Montana Public Service Commission to build a new gas-fired power plant and recover the cost of that plant through customer rates. Missoula City and County decided to get involved in that PSC process as interveners, which means that we'll have a seat at the table and the opportunity to testify before the PSC as they consider this decision. That's really important because these decisions made at the state level clearly have implications not only for our ability to achieve 100% clean electricity, but also for the rates we all pay for electricity and the risks that we're all forced to take on as rate payers. To sum it all up, as Tom Ludy put it in the Billings Gazette recently, it's not easy being green. But I know that the city and county are committed to doing what is in our power to achieve that 100% clean electricity goal because it's so essential to addressing climate change to avoiding the unmanageable. I've been talking a lot about what the city and county are up to, but the truth is that addressing climate change isn't just up to our local governments. It's not just up to our elected officials or to corporations or to experts. It's something we all have an important role to play in. And I'm gonna turn it back to Caroline to talk for a minute about that. We have some fun roller chairs here in the county uh, conference room. Uh, so as Diana said, it will take all of us. Um, and the, the number one question we get uh, is what can I do? And so we preempted it a little bit to talk with you all. And so because it's, it's not a simple answer, it's not a matter of um, just uh, you know driving less or flying less while those things are important. What each of us can do is unique to our backgrounds, skills, interests, um, and the problems that need to be solved. And so we would encourage everyone to do the following Venn diagram activity, which is inspired from um, inspired by Dr. Ayana Elizabeth Johnson, an acclaimed marine biologist and uh, editor of the anthology, All We Can Save. And so she asks us to fill out this Venn diagram of what brings me joy. So just think about what makes you happy. That's the simplest circle. 
uh, what can I bring? So this could be um, your background uh, from your formal studies, could bring your, be your social networks, it could be money. Um, it, it could be a whole range of things. It could be uh, dry jokes, which is what I put in my Venn diagram, which I'll share with you all. And then also what work needs to be done because there are parts, we need to break down parts of the climate change crisis um, and think about what bite-sized pieces we can take. And the reason we encourage you all to do this is because it will take everyone and it will take everyone showing up in a way that makes them happy and also pushes their comfort zone a little bit. But we have to have joy in it and we have to identify the ripple effect so that we're not just all doing this by ourselves in our homes. And so this is one way to do that. Um, I do this exercise from time to time, to check in on myself and make sure I'm on a good path. So I thought I'd share with you my most recent Venn diagram and I swear it changes a little bit each time. So there's no right or wrong answers when you do it. Um, I was told this morning, I forgot beavers on my, what brings me joy. So it really does change. Um, and as an example of how this all, how you can navigate this, um, something that makes me happy is staying up to date with what my family and friends are doing. I wouldn't push back too hard if someone said I could be a little nosy. Um, something I can bring as a young person working as a professional in this, in this field. Um, I have a pretty diverse social network. I work with people in all different generations and backgrounds, and so I have that. And then what is needed, I really believe there's so much need for intersectional work. And so um, that leads me to, to really focusing on, I zoomed in in case you couldn't read my messy handwriting, breaking down silos, building the biggest team possible and fighting with those at the margins. And so this is a way for you to think about your role in this movement um, and to figure out a way that feels good for you to show up um, and be a part of something. And as you do it, I really encourage you to think about where joy overlaps because this, this work is really hard and difficult and sometimes painful, but if we can find moments of catharsis and moments of happiness, um, that will keep us in it and keep us working together. And so once you build this diagram, I want you to ask yourself a second question, not just what can I do, but what's the next step? Um, this picture is from running a runner's edge event that was done in partnership with Climate Smart Missoula, running up for air, and it illustrates the task at hand perfectly. We are running together up a mountain and it's dark. Uh, it's okay that we can only see the next few steps through our headlamps because that's all we need to take the next step together. And so we just need to keep going up the mountain as a team. So finally, I'll leave you all with this quote from uh, climate scientist, Professor Kim Cobb. She says, science tells us that it's not too late, but we have to pull hard every day together to make a difference. You don't have to know where we'll end up. You just have to know what path we're on. So thank you everyone. We're excited for your questions and thanks for having us. So I'm gonna have my other panelists join me. All right, thank you, panelists, and really appreciate it. Um, ancient wisdom suggests that we should never let a good pun go unaddressed. And so, uh, Amy, you mentioned something about burning questions. Now it's time for those burning questions. Uh, Q&A is a very rich part of our City Club discussions. And again, as I said at the beginning, we are committed to civil discourse. So we ask that you keep your questions civil and that you avoid making blanket statements. So please use the Q&A function on your Zoom screen not the chat to type in your questions. And a couple of our board members will forward those questions to Brian, who will then ask our panelists. Thanks a lot, I will disappear now. Thanks. Um, I have so many thoughts and <laughs> questions for the presentation, but first and foremost, uh, thank you, Caroline, Amy, and Diana. Uh, Caroline mentioned uh, bringing dry jokes, and I uh, have thought that sometimes that's something I bring, except that I suspect that Caroline's jokes are funny, and I've yet to see any confirmation that mine are. So, uh, but Brian, if it brings you joy, it's okay. <laughs> it, it does. It does. It <laughs> selfishly brings me great joy. Um, I, uh, while we have uh, questions queue up here, um, I have one maybe to kick off and, and I, I see one already uh, also in the Q&A. Um, so when I worked uh, for this very large semiconductor company uh, supervisor, I worked with 
talked about the challenge and I've I found this challenge in every organization I've been in, uh, whether it's been a nonprofit environment, uh, for-profit, uh, government, you name it. And it's, it's a balancing question about how we approach what my old supervisor called the dailies, which are sort of the, what I think of as the daily tasks. And I think we're often o always overwhelmed by there being too many dailies uh, let a, to, to just get through alone, let alone think about the other grouping that he called, you know, the strategic uh, sort of issues. And I'm curious if any of the three of you or all three of you have any wisdom or practical advice on how you balance um, the dailies and the longer term strategic uh, sort of actions. I have found it always challenging on my own front and I'm always grateful for the wisdom of others. I think I'm gonna actually, I think Carol, I'm gonna have Caroline answer that because as she started this new really overwhelming job of leading our climate ready plan, um, I feel like you're enacting some pretty good strategies because I see your calendar. <laughs> Uh, I mean, the, the, the menial way I do it is I just block off time to do deep work and really think about it. I, you know, I try to spend about a quarter of my time doing that bigger picture strategic thinking. And uh, the good news is, though, I have weekly check-ins with, with these two here, and we always set aside time to try to get to some of that, which is really helpful just for brainstorming. Um, and I certainly learned from Amy to never waste uh, the time on, of a good run to mull over ideas. So that's kind of where our, our beer tasting idea came from. Not that that's the, the big problems, big picture thinking. Um, I think surround yourself with good colleagues who will push you to do that. Um, and also hold yourself accountable in whatever way um, you manage to. You know, for me, it's a calendar reservation. Um, for others, it could be something else. But that's what I'd say. I think Diana's great at it as well. She's shaking her head that she doesn't want to answer. <laughs> Thanks, Caroline. Um, I, I found you're great at it also. I, I just say, you know, to acknowledge, Brian, I, I think it's really hard. I think it's really easy to get, um, to always be plugging through the details. And I feel like it's something I've been trying more to, to, to step outside. I do usually often use, like today, I came down and said, well, I have to ride my bike so I can get my thoughts together <laughs> and sort of be trying to be outside, which again, could get challenging if we're not going to be outside because of wildfires constantly. We have to find those ways to, um, to, to just step out of the day to day. And for me, also, it's uh, just not being on the computer all the time. So that's where those runs come, come in handy, but, but also just closing down the computer and taking out a piece of paper. Yes. There's one thing I've learned as an elected official, closing the computer is a healthy thing. Um, I'm gonna to go to some questions that are queued up here. Uh, you can hear me okay, right, everybody? Yeah, okay. So this first one is from Jennifer Anthony. Uh, and the question is, if you have a window AC unit, can you put a special filter like a HEPA filter to reduce smoke from outside air? I don't think the filter that comes with the AC unit is particularly fine. Um, and I think the answer to that is yes, but would you like to elaborate? You know, though, my understanding, and again, this comes a lot from talking to, to Tom Javins, and if there's anything here that, uh, again, Wednesday night we can follow up um, and, and, and check out our, our website. There's a whole section on AC units. But those portable ones you stick in the windows, they don't have a place for a filter. They draw, they draw air directly from the outside. And you will have to be pretty cautious with any of our mechanical systems of just tacking on an extra filter for fear of overheating them or having them try to do something that they're not made to do. So one of the things that most people are doing is if they are um, bringing, using the AC, you can close that vent so that AC unit is working your home more and it's not bringing in that air. You can't do that forever. At some point you're gonna need air, air exchange. But you close the vent, you let the air cool, for those opportunities where the air quality is better and open that vent back up. And then you get yourself some fans and filters that are unattached to your little AC unit. A larger HVAC system in AC unit um, can sometimes have MERV 13 or those better air filters attached, brought in. But again, you wanna make sure that your unit can, um, that that works for your unit and you're not going to um, make your unit work in a way that it wasn't meant to. So this is when we thought, first started doing this, we're like, oh, we'll just have everybody put filters everywhere and we'll just fix it. And we learned that it's way more complicated and the larger the system, the more you know, commercial buildings, they, there's a lot to managing their systems. We have a great need for more um, HVAC technicians in our 
community and in our world, um, helping us out with all of that. So that's my, that's my short answer. Get the standalone filters to supplement your AC unit. Thanks. And, and you may have covered this already, Amy, but same uh, question on the same topic from Dave Oberling, um, Oberbill. Curious about the box fan and furnace filter idea. How much does it clean compared with a HEPA filter? Yeah. What are the components of a HEPA filter that could be added to clean it more? Um, anything to add? Yeah, those are great questions. Um, so we didn't we didn't have time, and so I'm glad these are coming up in the Q and A because I really wanted to share a little bit about what we've learned. So so maybe just a quick step back. Um, Tom Javins, who I've mentioned, he you know we wanted to say, hey, just put a filter by a fan, but what if it wasn't safe or effective? The safety being, what if you st uh, stick a, a filter on a fan and it overheats the fan and causes a house fire? That's not okay. Um, so Tom um, spent a whole winter, two winters ago, you know, in his basement doing all these tests. And as a good engineer does, he like repeated his tests over and over again. And basically the end result is that um, if you put the, the filters on the back of a fan, turn the fan on, the air will get pulled through. The fan should be about, you know, pretty new. The ones that are more than 10 years old might not have a fuse within them. So get a newer fan, um, attach them there. And then what we realized is that they are effective. We did some testing about the, basically that air, how often, it, how long it takes to return the air. Exact numbers are all gonna depend on how big is the airspace that you're trying to clean. If you have a big room with cathedral ceilings, it's gonna take more of those fans or more time, but they do work. Um, you have to close the windows um, and, and doors and, and kind of get that room to be as small and then you run that fan and it may take a little bit longer than the fancier machines, but over time, it basically the air just gets turned around and more and more of the air gets pulled through there and it ends up getting cleaner. We're not talking about purifying your air. We're just talking about getting it cleaner and getting it to a place where it's healthy to be there and be inside. Um, we have even on that on the website montanawildfiresmoke.org. If you go to the clean indoor air, we even have little videos about how to do it and some more information from Tom. He goes into um, you know which kind of filters you want to get and things like that. So we do encourage people to uh, poke around a little bit. Um, you know, one of the challenges we get, um, the, maybe the last piece on this is. You know, what if you really do need to open your windows to get some cooler air in? One of the biggest challenges is, you know, how do we address clean indoor air where you have to shut your uh, doors and windows with the fact that most of us cool our homes or many of us cool our homes by bringing in the cool air at night. Um, some people have been exploring putting a fan with that filter attached to it right in the window. So when the air first comes in, it's cleaned. Um, that's one possibility. Um, you know, you may be that you bring in a little cool air, your, your indoor air is a little less clean, then you shut it down and then you run these filter systems. But what we know is they do work. We've had air sensors inside and we've watched the air levels, the PM 2.5, um, the particulate matter just dive down pretty quick. So if anybody really wants to set up these systems and know, they can even buy some of these little purple air units in their own home and do their own air sensing. It's not an exact science, but it works. Thanks, Amy. Yeah, that's exactly the challenge uh, I know we're facing in our home is that we always, you know, try to bring in that cool air at night. And I know that we have one of those units I've invested in the PM 2.5 monitors. So we'll share our family data with you all because we're going to okay. definitely be working on bringing air in and then trying to clean it. I know the how the how quickly you can exchange the air is one of those metrics with the units. Yep, yep. And you know the fancier units that you buy, the HEPA portable air cleaners, the plug into the wall, they they have ratings when you go to to purchase one. It will have it's called a cater rating, clean air delivery rate, and it will tell you how often it changes the air on. But again, it's going to depend on the size of the room and things. So um, you know, at this point, if it's going to be a couple months, I know I just ordered an extra HEPA filter, and I'm getting an extra. I'm just going to get you know do what you can. Um, and, and I do, I feel like that's a great point, Brian, if we're, if some of us do have the ability to, you know, do a little experiments in our room or figure out what's work, it'd be great to share that because we're all learning. A couple of years ago, we weren't even, we didn't even realize that a fan filter system, we could recommend it. Um, but, you know, thanks to Tom's work, we feel like we can and we feel like it's a really good option for folks. The final thing I'll just say about that is a, that if we have a, a good long season of smoke, you probably need to replace that filter um, that's attached to your fan, you know, maybe once. You, you just look at it. If it gets really dirty, then you might have to get it another one. Yeah. Um, so that's really important too. Thanks. Um, important question here from uh, an anonymous attendee. Um, you mentioned, uh, 
you know, folks uh, buying two and donating one to the organization and uh, providing some to those in need. And one of the questions is, how are you identifying people in need of smoke filters? Yeah, thanks. Um, so again, we're, we're not by nature climate smart or social service organization. We don't have you know income verification systems set up by any means. And so our approach to all this has been um, let's let's use and build the trust we have in our community. Some of the folks, the the first project we have was working with we, Meals on Meals program, where they have already identified folks that could really use our services because. Um, some of their, their clients have both health issues and, you know, they would recognize they didn't have the means to purchase. So some of it's the partners that we work with. We just had a meeting with Food Bank. We have an opportunity to get some, hopefully some fans, um, filter systems out to some of their clients. So th they have already addressed that. Um, and, you know, to some degree, there's also a, a little bit of, of just trust involved and somebody has approached us and said, you know, I've got a preemie baby. I just came over to the hospital. I don't have any money. We try to help. And, and we hope that there's a pay it forward uh, sentiment that that person will then carry on. Um, so we, it, it's not like we're offering anybody something that costs five or $6,000. It's not taxpayer dollars. Our approach has been to just simply help people and, and ask people, hey, can you go buy this? And if they say yes, we encourage them. And if they say no, we try to help. We can't help everyone. That's, that's obviously the means. We just have tried our best um, to have, again, other community members um, maybe help with some of that pre-selection for sure. Thanks. Um, I have not felt like people are trying to take advantage of it. Again, we have a pretty small program at this point. So. Sure. Um, thanks. And I owe Dave Oberbilliger the apology for butchering his last name the first time. Uh, uh, haven't said it in a while. Um, great question uh, that he has here. Historically, there has always been smoke and we have been warned that our fire adapted forests could actually use more burning. How can we better understand that balance while also mitigating smoke related health issues? Yeah, maybe we'll just tag team this one. Um, you know, I don't have all the answers. I think obviously uh, this is such a big issue that there are more than us involved, right? This is forest scientists. This is our land managers. Um, these, this is more um, some of what Sarah at the air, you know, in our air quality division addresses. Um, I know we are working more with prescribed fire at different times of the year. And some of what we can do is educate people and say, hey, we, we do need a prescribed fire. We try to only burn when the, when the dispersion rates are working. And if they don't, you've got your HEPA air filter that you used back there in August or July, let's pull it out and use it again. So there is a balancer that's tricky. Um, and we also know that our forests are fire dependent and we are gonna see some smoke. And that's why so much of our efforts right now are on, you know, dealing with the fact that, that we are gonna see smoke. Now, did you wanna bring in the TK stuff? Uh, oh. You know, I guess the only other thing that I think we just have a lot to learn. I didn't know what I was going to say, and then I'll pass it on. Um, we've, we've just visited a little bit with all nations, and we've talked to folks at uh, CSKT, Confederate Salish and Kootenai tribes, and, you know, their their relationship with fire is really different. I think we have a lot to learn from working with the tribes and from understanding some traditional ecological knowledge about how you, um, you know, how you deal with something that, on one hand, seems like it's trying to kill us, and on the other hand, some of, you know, our Fires are a natural part of our systems, and how do we um, find a healthy relationship with that? Um, it, it's a lot of the work that we need to continue to do as, as a community, as a county, and also as individuals. And I'll, I'll add, I think that is exactly what Climate Ready Missoula tries to do. You know, some communities might just think, okay, wildfire, smoke, and heat, those are our biggest problems. How do we protect humans from that? But this process really tried to think about it holistically, think about our ecosystems, think about our wildlife, uh, the, you know, the way our forests have adapted and to center those interconnections. And so we are trying to connect with the forest service, with people working on smoke and make sure that we're all working together and not just in silos, but approaching resiliency more holistically. Thanks. Um, question here and Diana, you may want to take a crack at this. It's, it's a big one. Um, but you spoke uh, about a subject near and dear to my heart, the 100% Clean Electricity Initiative and our work there. And I think this, this question touches on that. Uh, it's from Craig Stahlberg and it's, can you help break down the cost resources needed to generate the electricity needed to replace the fossil fuel consuming machinery, uh, autos, furnaces, et cetera? 
So again, can you help break down the cost resources needed to generate the electricity that we need to replace the fossil fuel uh, consuming side of the equation? The cost resources, was that the question? Yeah, to generate the electricity uh, that we need to replace from the fossil fuel using um, and generating, I think I would uh, add to the question. Yeah, so I mean, I guess at, at a high level, what we need to, if, in order to not only replace our current um, fossil fuels that are currently used to generate electricity with clean resources, but then to actually expand our electricity sector in order to electrify most or all of our buildings and our transportation, we need a lot more renewable energy, solar and wind. We're gonna need a lot more energy storage. So batteries, um, pumped hydro storage or other technologies that, that provide um, that service. Because of course the solar energy and wind energy are intermittent. Um, they're dependent on when the sun shines and when the wind blows. Um, we're likely to need more um, dispatchable renewable energy as well to get there. So whether that there's a number of things that can fill that role. Hydropower to some extent can fill that role because you can control it to some extent. Um, uh, clean, sustainable biomass energy can fill that role. Geothermal electricity generation can fill that role. So there's a number of options that, um, that can scale up and be part of this solution. We're gonna need a lot more on the demand side too. So a lot more flexibility, not just, not just thinking about the electricity system as that having the kind of consumers of electricity who are just receiving electricity when they need it, but having the consumers be part of the solution in the sense that on the, on the consumption side, um, we have some flexibility. So we give back to the grid, for example, through rooftop solar, through electric vehicles that can provide power back through their batteries to the grid when it's needed, then, then get um, use that from the grid um, when, when they need it. Um, and through a, a lot more energy efficiency and demand response such that we can, for example, turn our water heaters on or have our water heaters automatically turn on at times when there's a lot of solar and wind power available on the grid, um, rather than just randomly whenever they happen to cycle on and off. All of that is, is going to be an important part of that clean energy future. Um, and a more robust transmission system as well to get uh, clean electricity. Um, from where it's available um, in large, in, on a large scale to where it's needed, as well as a lot more distributed renewable energy. So again, the small scale rooftop solar, for example. Um, in terms of cost, there are a lot of studies out there that have tried to estimate that. Um, I don't know that I have numbers on the, on the tip of my tongue here um, to provide, but I can certainly point the questioner toward, toward those types of studies. Some of these things in the long term will be cost savings, energy efficiency is is cost saving. Um, building a new electric home in a lot of cases is, is lower cost than building a new home with the, the gas lines and gas infrastructure um, to, to, to heat and cool it using, using gas systems. So um, I think there's a lot of considerations there, but those are just some of the things that will need to be involved in that transition. No, thanks. That was comprehensive. And as you said, you know, the, the dollar that no one spends on energy uh, that we don't need because of efficiency or something is, you know, the cheapest uh, starting point. And uh, you mentioned that uh, our intervention at the in the rate in the um, generation case uh, with the the facility, as well as some there's other elements to that case that the city and county are intervening in with some battery storage. And I think folks interested in those details and all of the things that you were mentioning um, will be very interested in the details that come through that hearing and that uh, case through the PSC. And I, I think it's fair to say that's one of the primary, if not the primary reason for our intervention is to help shine a light on the data and the details, uh, including the costs uh, associated with, you know, these sorts of decisions. Um, and you mentioned, Diana, you know, the, how the dramatic drop in the cost of solar, for instance, uh, we're seeing that same uh, kind of trend with wind power. And so it, it's really important that everybody, you know, pay attention and see uh, the true sort of relative costs and, and benefits of these, uh, particularly the re renewable resources, which are winning the cost, you know, benefit uh, sort of argument uh, across the country uh, time and time again. So 
Thanks. I'm going to move us here to a couple more. Uh, Lynn Woodfields asks, is there any kind, and I, I have, <laughs> I confess, I have thought about this a lot too. Um, is there any kind of technology that can actually pull smoky air out of the climate on a mass scale? Um, yeah, it, it, believe me, we've been, people have thought about that too. What if we just put some big fans on the top of Jumbo and blew it somewhere else, right? Turned it around. Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't know that we have that for, for wildfire smoke. I think we have, um, you know, I think foresters will talk about forest management. There's nothing that pulls that air out um, until it gets into a building. Um, there are things we can do. Um, you know, we've gotten pretty used to masks in this last year and a half. Cloth masks do not work for PM 2.5, but N95 respirators, those small ones that have the two straps that can seal up pretty tight, they can work if it, if it means that you're then a lot, you know, more able to be outside um, when it's truly bad. Um, so yeah, I, I haven't heard of anything. <laughs> um, you know, let us know if you do hear of anything. Um, I, I think the, the other point is just to make sure that you're really paying attention to the air quality. There are times where it seems like it's really smoky out and those smokes could be, uh, that, that haze could be really high in the sky and actually not necessarily affecting us with PM 2.5 high levels. And so don't crawl into your closet and plan to stay there for three months because there are times where the air quality is pretty good. There are times where the wind's gonna blow and it's gonna blow out and take that opportunity to be outside, be in your garden, recreate, get together outside. Um, so, so the smoke will, if, if the fires burn, and again, unfortunately our, our valley, we, we get smoke from California all the way up through BC, it's going to come here, but we just have to, um, there, there are ways that we can kind of manage our, our activities around that. So sorry if that was Thanks. a yeah. Yeah. answer. No, no, the, the, the mass scale device, I think I'm uh, influenced by reading many Dr. Seuss books with some sort of contraption that would, uh, would help us on this front. Um, and I think you just touched on this, Amy, but maybe uh, hit it again from John Torma. Is the KN95 face mask that we've all come to know and love during COVID-19 effective for filtering smoke particulate? So, so the material in a KN95 is that it does filter out the 2.5, but those masks aren't meant to really create quite a tight seal. Um, so it sort of depends on, on what, you're, what you're looking for. That The N95s have a tighter seal. So when you go, they, they, you know, then you know you're not getting any. But again, are you trying to purify it or just bring in some proportion of, of, of cleaner air? It's tricky because if people have difficulty breathing, maybe you have you know, asthma or something, wearing a respirator like that is, is harder. You're gonna have to breathe deeper to get the air in and that may not work. So I, I think trying out some of those can, just trying to get a pretty tight seal might be helpful. It's just not gonna be a complete panacea. And we're still trying to figure that out. Um, I, I'd look that Sarah Cofield from the air quality um, team here, she's gonna be putting out some more information on the county, you know, city county health department's website and in the Missoula and with a few more details around that. Cause you know, I, I am not, uh, a health professional air quality specialist, but that's kind of what we've been thinking about. Thanks. Um, Russ Fletcher asked, what level of MERV filter should we buy? And perhaps you have more detail about those on the website or anything to quickly share. Uh, that's a, a rating I'm very familiar with from buying filters. <laughs> yeah, it was a rating I didn't know anything about four years ago or something, but MERV 13 is ideal for uh, attaching to your filter the, the higher the number the more it filtrates out but 11 or 12 will work they will help clean your air what you don't want is like an eight so go for the higher number and stay and yeah just go for the higher number thanks 13 is uh, good holly rollins asks the presenters mentioned going for a run where do they go for a run in this air quality and i might <laughs> amend to that question um because i i find this relative to you know activities we plan with our nine-year-old daughter uh, and, and, you know, to, to partially answer perhaps from our perspective, this is where one of the many ways that the information we get from Sarah Cofield in her emails really helps us uh, because we wind up learning things and then being having resources available to us to look at how things changes, how things change during the day and, and regionally and locally. And then we wind up planning around that, but um, that people would be more interested in your answer. <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, you, you hit it, Brian, that air quality changes frequently. And so if you can find a window to get out, um, please do so. And also, while wildfire smoke is universally bad for all of us, some of us have more acute, immediate responses than others. For instance, my partner's really sensitive. She cannot go outside when it's unhealthy for sensitive groups, would not run. I could maybe do a brief 20 or 30 minute run then. And that's just kind of getting a sense of your own um, comfort. And then I'll also say it's really important to have diverse coping mechanisms. Um, there will be some days where you can't really do that high level activity. So whether it's doodling or reading or putting on a really nice lotion on your hand, my therapist told me that once, can be really calming. And so finding things you can do inside at any point is really helpful. Thanks. And I uh, want to thank Sarah Cofield. She wrote in and you mentioned some of this, Amy, but I just want to read this for the benefit of the audience. This was the answer for John. Uh, KN95s have the same filtration for smoke that N95s do, but because they have ear loops instead of headbands, they do not form as tight of a seal to the face. So it's easier for polluted air to come in around the sides. If you use a KN95, make sure it has a tight seal to the face. Um, so thank you, Sarah. Um, just a, a one more thing about the, the where to go running. I mean, the other thing that's kind of interesting, and you know, everybody's going to have different capacity to do this. Um, you know, the best thing for somebody who's pretty tied to town with family or work obligations, you know, maybe you get one of those bike trainers and so you could just ride your bike, um, you know, next to your air filter inside when you really need some exercise and you may get your frustrations out. Um, the other thing we've done over the years on the air quality section of montanawildfiresmoke.org, there's some really cool maps where you can see where the smoke is headed and you can see where it is. And sometimes I've been surprised over the years. It's like, wow, it is horrible here. Dang, there's no smoke in St. Regis. And we went on a hike in a different direction. And had we gone down the bitter route, we would have been choking. So, you know, really it takes a little effort. It again, depends on your capacity, but trying to get out on the weekends, maybe going in some direction where there isn't smoke, if, if that's um, one way to do it, being a little bit more creative. Um, I know I'm not as, as sensitive maybe as some folks. So sometimes for my own mental health, even if it's, you know, I don't do this when it's up in the red or the purple zone, but, uh, you know, I'll go out for 15 minutes um, at, or do a, a shorter exercise. It's, it's also intensity and duration of that exercise that it's impactful. So maybe you still do get out and do something to keep your, to keep your sanity. Thanks. Uh, very logical uh, set of questions from Lisa Biscavich. Is Sarah Cofield's air quality update email on your website? I think meaning the Climate Smart website and how can people sign up for these updates? It is on the montanawildfiresmoke.org website. Is there a sign up page there? It goes, there is a link to the county. I will right after this make sure um, that that's very clear and that's right up there. Because yeah, what Sarah will do is she has she has a listserv and she will um, just blast it out directly to folks. You can always find it on her, on the air quality um, what page of, of the city county health department's website, but you can get on her direct list and have that come right into your, into your you know, email feed. Um, we'll make sure that that's really clear. And Sarah, you're out there. We should just have you up here, but uh, but type something in the chat if you would like um, if you would like to share anything more than that. Thanks. Um, sorry, navigating a little bit here. Um, this was not posted as, as a question, but I think it's a, it's a good point for any of you to respond to. It's from John Pillsworth. And it's a statement we always argue about, should we mitigate the problem or try to make the complete change necessary to, to help solve the problem? And when I read this, it immediately brought to mind um, the, uh, the comments about managing the unavoidable and avoiding the unmanageable. What would you like to, would any of you like to expand on that? Sure. Yeah, that's exactly right. I think the answer at this point is we just have to do both. Um, you know, from a personal perspective, when I started working on climate issues 15, 20 years ago, it seemed like maybe we could get away with just mitigation. Maybe we could avoid climate impacts on a large scale. And if we acted quickly enough, and that didn't happen, right? So now 15 years later, we're in the situation where the impacts are are getting pretty severe already. And so very clearly we need to be managing those impacts, but there's still so much room left to avoid um, much, much worse impacts. And so I think there's just no alternative but to, to do both. Anybody wanna add anything? 
Thanks. All right. And Sarah uh, wrote in, and um, you can email Sarah at uh, S uh, Schofield, S C O E F I E L D, at Missoula County altogether.us to get on her list. And you can find the updates online uh, at Missoula County, again, altogether.us forward slash current A Q, C U R R E N T A Q for air quality. Um, thank you, Sarah. And uh, a couple other questions here uh, from Linwood Fields. What do you think about cloud seeding to help prevent drought? I'm not an expert at that. I have read in the long term, you know, if we're going to have drought, we're going to have drought. But I know that there are some, I've heard that there are some localized um, effectiveness there, but I'll pass it off to see if anybody else is more connected. Uh, you know, I think I'm inherently skeptical of some of those geoengineering approaches. I would say let's focus on solutions that we know work and are really healthy for our ecosystem. So can we expand natural storage? Can we do beaver mimicry higher up in our watersheds to keep water in our watersheds longer and for longer parts of the season? These are solutions that we know have a ton of potential. We are aware that there really aren't many downsides. It's just a matter of implementing them. So I, I'm focused on more of those issues than, um, than the, the cloud seeding, which honestly, I don't know a ton about, but um, that would be my instinct. Thanks. Um, there's a question here, a little off topic, but if any of you, since there's a bit crossover, I know with the city's, uh, um, zero by 50 plans. Can we make recycling mandatory in Missoula? This was done in uh, Logan, Utah, in conservative Logan, Utah. You know, we don't, yeah, we don't have the, the, um, the new city, uh, Lee Raderman, who is the new Taste Jones at the city. So um, she, I think her title's a little bit, it's climate action specialist. action specialist, right? Thank you. She just got a, um, an improved title anyway, <laughs> um, would be the best person to speak to that. And so we, you could, you know, email me. I think there's we're, there's definitely an interest in including lots of zero waste efforts in all of this work. Um, it is a way to save energy. The work that Home Resource does and keeping materials out of the landfill has an impact on, on our overall um, carbon emissions. The city right now is, is finishing up uh, an inventory on municipal, you know, Operation greenhouse gas emissions, how much does waste contribute to that? All of that stuff we need at the community level. So there's clearly waste as part of that. Um, the zero waste movement is super um, important and valuable. Mandating recycling right now is tricky because um, we run into a problem that nobody wants our plastic trash. Nobody wants our single use plastic because it's not valuable. China doesn't want it. Um, we are, a lot of people are thinking about bigger ways to stop using it so we don't have to recycle. So we're using compostable products like at, at, at Missoula downtown um, events. And so those make compost and those things we get to the compost. And I think right now, um, and that turns into soil and that turns into, that's ultimately a greenhouse gas benefit. So I think a lot of the efforts at the city right now um, and in some of the partnerships are thinking about um, instead of recycling the reuse, uh, taking the things that we can, really encouraging, or you know, potentially even you know, at some point, you know, maybe we'll all be composting because those systems will be set up, and that may be more important than at least plastic recycling. I think a lot of people recycle aluminum. There's good value there. Always recycle your aluminum. Um, that has a great energy balance. Um, so right now, I think we have to wait to hear from the city about where some of those things are going to go from. Um, more education and incentives um, to ultimately mandating. It's, it's less about whether we should do that, it's about how we know it's difficult. Thanks. Um, there's a quick plug here. I just want to mention uh, from Allison about Respro makes a good reusable air pollution mask. So not someone, uh, not a manufacturer I'm familiar with, but I thought I'd just mention Respro. Um, and then uh, uh, Dave again uh, has a good question really directed to the city. Uh, the ways that the city has engineered bicycle access over the last 25 years has been great. So much encouragement for people to bicycle more. Has the city considered limiting some streets, not just bike lanes, to bicycles only? I will quickly say um, we have very aggressive mode shift goals. Uh, the, during my time on council, we've embraced those setting very challenging goals in that front. 
I think we've done a number of things, uh, some of which I'm sure Dave is referencing around uh, bike lanes and on, uh, I'm thinking of, I'm gonna get the numbers wrong, but maybe Fifth Street, Sixth Street sort of area uh, where you know, we reduced the lane of traffic, kept multiple lanes at the intersections, but really expanded the, uh, and made much more safe the bicycle there. I'm dodging the specific question a little bit, but I'll leave that for uh, a public works uh, committee hearing or something like that. But I, I think it is fair to say uh, we have set really aggressive goals on that front and um, council has not shied away from uh, addressing uh, and stepping up to those aggressive goals. So anything you guys would like to add on uh, the bicycling front? Um, I'll, I'll use it as a pivot maybe, because yeah, we, we don't want to the city. I think I think you covered that well. Um, the lo well, the long range transportation plan, it does. It's going to head us in the really great directions. Um, lots of really good work. Um, one thing, you know, as we talk about wildfire smoke, I know sometimes talking to the transportation experts, they're like, you know, be a little careful again, if the air quality just looks a little bad, but isn't that bad and everybody stops riding their bike and jumps in their single occupancy vehicle cars, we're gonna have more localized pollution from just car exhaust. And so I do think it's important for us to, again, watch those air quality levels. You may be able to bike or you could take the bus. The more of us, the, the bus is safe now, the more of us jumping back on the bus um, is a good way to get around. They're, we're getting more electric buses all the time and that's a good low emissions way to get around. So we do wanna think about sometimes you know, when we're, we're doing things for our own health, how does that impact our community? Um, try to keep walking, biking, and busing as best you can, even during the smoke when it's, when it health allows. How's that for a pivot? That's great. We've wrapped up our, our, we've wrapped up our questions. I think we're pretty much right on time. I'll, I'll use a brief opportunity to thank the three of you again. Uh, and I wanna thank all the folks at City Club, uh, Brett and everybody on the board, also, folks that helped make this happen, uh, Eric and Sarah and several other people I am failing to name, um, but uh, thank you. And with that, I'm going to invite Brett back. Back. Thank you, uh, Amy, Carolyn, Diana, and, and Brian. It's an extremely timely and important presentation that you've, uh, you've provided for us, uh, and I, I am extremely grateful. And uh, I'm also grateful to you, our audience, whom I can't see, but I, I know you're out there. Without you, this would all be pointless. So thank you for, for giving us your time. And again, thank you to our sponsors, especially the University of Montana, First Security Bank, and Blackfoot Communications. I hope you can all join us on August 9th for our next forum, which we hope to have in person once again at the Doubletree Hotel. We're still working out some details, but it looks like it will be our mayoral candidate forum. Uh, please check our website and our Facebook page later this week for more information as we have it available. And with that, I bid you all goodbye. Thank you so much. Thank you.